Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Michael and Patty Show, a completely unscripted, unprepared for podcast that has everything to do with our approximately 40 years and thousands of transactions in PEI real estate and just Prince Edward Island in general. So if you're interested in PEI real estate or you're, you'd like to know more about the island, this is the podcast for you. If it isn't, I suggest you delete it and move on to the next one. Today, I have my co-host. Her name is Patty. Hi, Michael. Hi, everyone. And we are discussing what Patty discovered to be the most popular PEI-related search term. If you know what that is, pause now, write it down so we can confirm it later. That search term is waterfront property, which, in fact, is probably what everybody wants, regardless of where they're moving to in the world, because waterfront property has a certain mystique or aura about it. What would you say? Feelings. There's a connection there with certain astrological signs, like the Aries. Waterfront property is always sold for more. However, there's a lot of things you need to look at when you're buying waterfront property that you don't necessarily have to look at when you're buying non-waterfront property. So we're going to discuss all of these things. We're going to touch on building permits, surveys, plot plans, maybe even spice it up a little bit. We'll talk about erosion reports so you can see if your land will be there in 20 years when you intend to build on it and a bunch of other things. What did you want to cover first that's most exciting? Most exciting about waterfront properties? Let's define waterfront property. How we start there? We'll think, we'll think with a lawyer brain. What is waterfront property? My definition and understanding of waterfront property is property that touches the high water mark or water on Prince Edward Island. People ask, can you own property that is touching the water? And technically, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, the government has right or usage of all waterfront property around, I guess, across the country. When you buy waterfront property in PEI, where I would start is I would ask that particular purchaser, what what do you mean by waterfront property? Are, are you on a pond, a creek, a river? Are you on the Northumberland Strait? Are you on the Gulf of St. Lawrence? For marketing purposes, I always refer to the north and the south shores ocean front, but technically it's not. But how many people are going to be searching for Northumberland Strait waterfront property? Most people are going to want something that's either on this north or the south shore in context with PEI. The difference being the North Shore is more ocean-like. You've got the crashing waves, the, the sound, the open views. There's nothing in the distance other than water. Yeah, the more it's a more raw experience. Higher banks. Correct. Higher winds, higher damage to your house or cottage. Whereas the South Shore, what that's going to give you is it's going to give you some views of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Confederation Bridge, maybe a lighthouse in the distance or a small island, depending on where you are. And it's going to give you some really warm waters. I prefer, personally prefer the South Shore, but they, you know, a lot of people prefer that ocean feel on the North Shore. And that's why you find our number one touristy beach, Cavendish, is located on the North Shore. Now, once you decide what kind of waterfront you want, you can talk to your agent. They can look it up on MLS and you can search for properties that come down to size and price, in my opinion. How much do you want to spend? Your agent can educate you on what you can find for certain prices and how much property you want. Other considerations I would have, and then Patty can give me her list, is bank. I don't necessarily want a bank that's 150 feet high, and if I fall off it, I'm going to die. I'd rather have something ideally where I can walk out onto the white sandy beach. However, that's going to be really difficult to find, and if you do, you're going to pay for it. PEI is a fairly low-lying province, so you are going to have a lot of properties that are swampy. They're very low, and even though you have that white sandy beach, like say in North Lake, you've got swamp on the front, so you have to wear uh, rubber boots or a whole scuba outfit to reach the beach or have a boardwalk, whereas if you go out in Roseville, where it's almost impossible to get to your property, you're on a 90 or 100 foot bank. Any considerations, Patty? No, I think you covered. I mean, those are obviously very important. 
what kind of experience is the buyer looking to have? And you're absolutely right. Do they want a riverfront? Or do they want more of that vast ocean kind of view and experience? So these are things that they'd have to consider. And then they'd have to get into, you know, again, land that is more exposed does have a higher risk of when some of our nor'easters and our storms hit, perhaps for a little bit of land erosion or losing some of your bank. And again, depending on how what kind of bank you have, and where you're situated, because there's some areas around the island that have higher chance of actually having a storm hit hit them and losing land, or they have a higher erosion rate. Typically, the areas that you're going to find that are going to be more problematic with land loss, let's refer to it, is, a, is it either a cape or an inlet. And not only will you suffer potential wind or water erosion, but what will happen in the winter is you'll have big slabs of ice and snow cutting underneath the bank, which will remove massive chunks of your land, which some people will use or install erosion barriers, but they can get expensive unless your neighbors are doing it. You're going to be the only one sticking out in the middle of the water. With reference to your question earlier, can you own waterfront? You can own water. It all comes down to the deed. Do you own up to the high water mark, median water mark, low water water mark? There's deeds in Charlottetown. You actually have a water deed as well. The Charlottetown Yacht Club, my understanding, and I could be wrong, I often am, has water water deeds or water underwater deeds or whatever you want to refer to them as, where you actually own part of the water so you can put decks or, in this instance, a yacht club in. The more modern subdivisions we've discussed in pe- previous podcasts have what are referred to as buffer zones. The long and short of that is it's basically a amount of property that's in front of your property. It's typically owned by the homeowners association or the developer, and it is 60 times the yearly rate of erosion times two. You could ask for an exclusive easement, which would mean you're the only one that can use that portion of property. However, most people in most cases don't do that because they don't have the legal understanding of what that means or they don't even know they can obtain that. Next step, if you're looking for waterfront property, probably the first step is after you talk to your agent, get an active real-time search set up. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree. So that, and again, in previous podcasts, we've explained that will give you listings for all the agents, all the brokers and offices as they become alive. What else might I look for when I see a property? I'd probably go on Google Earth, Bing Maps. I'd go to the half dozen different government sites I have access to. i draw the property lines. I go to the agricultural computer, which we've shared that link before, which will show you the soil types. Because if I do buy 50 acres on the water or 10 or 3 or 2, I can't necessarily build on any of that, depending on the soil types and the elevation and a number of other things. And the setbacks for that particular, because I have had in the past four and a half acres of land. And unfortunately, there was such a small, there was a 10,000 square foot area bordering the uh, back or closest to the road uh, portion of this property, which didn't appeal to everybody. Setbacks are can be a little bit problematic too and something that a, a consumer, a buyer needs to be aware of. Well, not only would there be setbacks, but you'd have the buffer zone, but you'd also have a distance between the septic and the well as well, per se. That's kind of catchy. We could put that on a bumper sticker. Who can I call to make sure that I can do anything with this property? And what do I need to do to make sure it's it's suitable to build on? I typically have... Access PEI. Access PEI. However, it's not something, Michael, and this is why I just stalled there. It's a lot of the information can only be provided to the seller. Um, well, they're doing that now because they don't want to work... How would you phrase this assertively? You used to be able to phone access PEI, give them the PID number, which is between three and eight digits on the island, and they would just open their books. They'd tell you everything on file, what you can do with the property, what you can't. These days we're finding the resistance seems to be a lot higher where they don't want to deal with anyone unless they're the owner or they have a contract in place to buy that property. Would you agree? A hundred percent. Access PEI would be your key focus point, they're the ones who are going to issue the building permits, which would typically be good for two years. Yes, they have to break soil, though, within one year's time now. 
the project has to be started. Be mindful if you are requesting a building permit. They do want the project started within a 12-month period. At least that was my my last update. Right. And where, how do I know where the property is? I get the PID number. Can I trust the government maps when they draw those nice little pretty pictures? I would say probably not. The answer is no. They're pretty good, but you definitely should not trust the government maps. They are a guide. They usually have a disclaimer on every screen that tells you they are a guide. Most of the ones I've seen are awesome and fairly accurate, but I've also seen ones that were off by tens of acres and hundreds of feet. Do not be one of these people that ends up building your house or cottage on a neighbor's lot or over the property line. Or we had one client that actually built their or bought the lot that was on the opposite end of the street. They didn't even know what property they were buying. That's not good. That's They said something like, this isn't good. <laughs> In an ideal world, it would be nice to have a survey done if there's any structures, a plot plan. Perk tests, you know, you'll get people asking, well, is there a perk test done? You don't want to tell them it's a stupid question, but it's a stupid question if you're looking at 50 acres because you're not going to, you might build anywhere on that property. There's a thousand different places you could build on that property, so you're not going to do a single perk test. If anything, if you wanted to spend the money, and most likely you're not going to, you'd have an engineering report on that piece of property that would have a ton of test pits that would give you an idea of not only the perk category one, two, or three, one being the best for septic, but it would also give you the elevations of the property. We haven't been getting into elevations so much except within the last 20 years, because as we discussed subdividing before, you used to just write it out in the back of a napkin, hand it in and get it stamped. Now we're getting into flood diagrams, erosion reports, elevations, all kinds of different stuff. So if you are buying a property, in my opinion, it would be nice to have it surveyed. In most cases, the vendor's not going to pay for that. You probably will. And the bigger the piece of the land and the more forested it is, the more expensive it's going to be to survey. Absolutely. Should I get it surveyed if the pins are there from 1981? The pins, that's an interesting topic all in itself. I would say... You should get it surveyed, even if you do see the pins. We call it being repinned or the survey pins, survey markers uh, validated because I have seen this done on the island where farmers or neighbors will pull out a pin and relocate it conveniently. And I don't know if they do it bit by bit over the years, but I wouldn't trust where the markers are located. Well, in the old days, in certain parts of the island, North Shore, they would, <laughs> you know, the, the buyer would say, geez, I wish this lot was a little bigger, and they'd move the pen. Oh, just because they moved the pen didn't change the deed. And in fact, I was involved with one transaction that turned into an absolute disaster, where they had moved the pens, supplied a fraudulent survey, indicated where the fraudulent pins were, and it was just a big mess. And it came down to the fact that the purchaser was assuming the survey and the big metal or uh, plastic pipes indicating where the property markers were imagined to be by the vendor for the purposes of the sale actually weren't. Theoretically, even if it was surveyed six weeks ago, who's to say someone didn't run over a marker and move it? Moving along, you know, nice to have a survey that's accurate that you can trust. The challenge is it takes a long time to get that. Building permits... When you're looking at property, 50 acres is probably going to be free of any restrictive and, and or protective covenants telling you what you can and cannot do with that land. When you get outside the city centers, there is no zoning per se. The province has been working on that for years. If you buy 50 acres of nail pod, it's not going to tell you exactly what you can and cannot do with that property. However, if you are in a subdivision, then you're dealing with rules, regulations, potential bylaws, or the gating the community from fall to spring, who pays for the road, HOA fees. You're going to get into a lot more. So if you want your freedom, buy raw acreage, one to three acres on your own little private laneway, or maybe it touches a paved road. So Michael, would you call a waterfront property that has a buffer waterfront? 
That is a very good trick question, Patty, and I'm <laughs> glad you brought that up, but not really. <laughs> In my opinion, it would be waterfront, but it would have a buffer in front of it and should be presented to the potential purchaser in that form. What happens with the buffers is originally the developer owns them, and then when all the lots sell or most of them sell, they traverse it to the homeowners association. So the homeowners association owns the buffer zone on a fractional basis. I think like anything you do in real estate, you just need to disclose it. 100%, 100%, get them to sign off, show them the survey. As far as whether it's waterfront or not, I'm sure if I go to Google, there'll be a multitude of different definitions. What's your opinion? I do struggle with this. I have had sellers say, I want it listed as waterfront because no one can develop. It's it's a buffer zone owned by the developer or the HOA. So therefore, in their opinion, I just make sure that I include in the overview that the buffer zone is owned by whomever. So I do struggle with that. That is something. But again, I'll list it as waterfront now, just because I've bunted hence a few times with some property owners. And I know it is what buyers are looking for. And I'd hate for someone to miss out on a wonderful property because they're assuming it is only water view. And here there's no development that can happen between them and the water. And the re- what's the reason for the buffer zones? We did have a whole episode on this. It is to protect the land. It, it ensures that that property owner will have that land for, and you have the, the formula. 60, 60 times the yearly rate, rate of erosion times two. So if it was one foot per year, one foot per year, it'd be 120 feet. And you're absolutely right. It was intended to protect protect the land property owner against erosion based on past historical data, past land erosion historical data? Yes. Yeah. So I think it's still very high value land. And I do try to educate my clients as best as I can, because many don't understand. They don't understand it. They just kind of get stuck going, well, I don't own the waterfront. You stay there long enough, your land will be the waterfront. Uh, enjoy the fact that this developer had some foresight to protect the integrity of your investment and that you will have land for many, many, many years and generations to come. Investor tip, if you bought a small waterfront, or let's say you bought a small lot in a cottage subdivision that was developed back in the 70s or 80s, it would be smart to buy two or three rows back because in theory, it's going to be waterfront at some point. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Now, let's say I'm looking at a property and I'm curious what the erosion is like. How much does it lose per year? Is there, is there a map? Maybe there's a map that shows me in different colors, yellow, red, green, that tells me what the erosion is like in different parts of the island. Maybe I could just send the PID number in and someone sends me back a beautiful report and explains erosion. Is that possible? There is a beautiful report. It's called CHIPS. It's a CHIPS report. Do you know what that stands for? California Highway Patrol? (laughs) Coastal Hazard Information, and I'm assuming program? Coastal Hazard Information So we both don't know, but you can... Take the PID number. There's a free service from the Prince Edward Island government where you you submit the PID number. You tell them you're a buyer, seller, real estate agent, whatever. Can you send me back a report? Within usually a few days, you get the whole report. Yeah, it's Coastal Hazards Information Platform is what it is. What's S? There is no S. It's just the chip. And they are very prompt. They're very efficient. You send in the information. And I'd say within a week, you will have a very detailed, full, impressive report on that particular property and area. So that's a, that's an awesome thing you can order at no cost. We can look at the soil map, soil maps, the agricultural computer. The next thing the government's going to ask you to do in most cases, and just as a Side note, the government, if you're in a subdivision or an area where there's 50 houses along the same stretch, they're going to have a pretty good idea as to what the soil maps are like. However, if you're out in the boondocks and nowhere and it's 100 acres and it's never been developed anywhere, they're probably, they're going to have a guide by using the agricultural computer, which has mapped the entire island, but they're still 
In most cases, almost all cases, they're going to ask you to do a perk test, which is short form for percolation, which involves digging a ditch with an excavator or a backhoe, and they look at to see how fast the water comes into the hole. They take a little test tube with a tube, sort of a test tube with a tube on the end, and they put it in the bank, and they pour water in it and see how long it takes the water to dissipate. They also take soil samples, send them back to a lab, and then what they will do is they'll say it's a category one, two, or three. One is perfect, two you had fill, three is engineered, and you need to run you need to run for the hills at that point. If it's a four for sure you Well, run. four is unheard of. I mean they exist, but three's bad enough. Three means you need an engineered system. Putting a, a standard septic system in PEI is fairly inexpensive. Adding some fill, not a huge deal. Engineered system, major nightmare. Plus, now you have a system maintained, and you may have lift pumps and electrical system and electrical conduits and breaker panel, and it's too complex. Unless you're absolutely fallen in love with that property, aim for Category 1 or 2. The other thing is, do your perk tests at the best time of the year, maybe June, July, August. Don't do it in, well, you can't do it in April, because they usually test between May and November. Don't do it on May 1st after we've had 30 feet of snow and rain for the last month and they moved the road so now the water's on your lot. Do it so it's conducive to getting good results and under realistic expectations. Yes, I've seen many who get even our rain season, October, November, getting perk tests and it didn't seem to get as good a result as they wanted to. So I think we covered a ton of great information. We're not closing her yet because we haven't built our spot. What are we building? If we want to build our house or a cottage, where can we go to get the plans and or the building supplies? Plans or building supplies? That's a good question, Patty. (laughs) On PEI, your chances are you're going to get your building supplies for probably Home Depot, Kent, BMR, Home Hardware. You know, there's probably a half a dozen different suppliers of the building supplies. However, particular places, and I've heard, don't quote me, Places like Kent will actually design your house a cottage, house and or cottage free of charge if you use them for your supplies. If you don't want a building supply place to design your structure, there's all kinds of plan, building plan sites on the internet. I've used e-plans. I've got business partners that use Genish Homes. There's all kinds of them. So now you have your plans. You've got your supplier. You find a builder, which we've covered in previous podcast episodes. Bob's your uncle. They call you. The keys are ready, and you move in. Yes, I thought it was far more complex of an... Oh, no, it's so easy, Thaddy. <laughs> and the other thing you can do is it's mind-blowing in closing what you can rent some of these places out for. I was in a little cottage the other day, and they're getting $4,500 a week, which is... That used to be luxury zone before for something that was 6,000 square feet, and they're getting it for a 2,000 square foot cottage now. I think we've covered it. Yes, I think we've covered waterfront properties, everything you need to know from start to finish. Hopefully you find, if you are one of those looking for a waterfront property, you find the perfect piece. You call a real estate professional, a realtor, and they will help you make your dreams a reality. Thanks for watching, or or I'm still in YouTube mode. Thanks for listening to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe to it and spam all your friends that you have their email addresses for Facebook contact information. Tell us about, tell them about our podcast, even if they're not interested in PEI real estate, just so we can drive our numbers and our stats up. Sounds good. Until next time, have a great day, everybody. Bye for now.